<laughs> Hi, this is Nicholas Vids, um, and I'm talking on Without Your Head. Always remember to keep your head. Welcome to the Station of Decapitation Without Your Head. I'm Nasty Neal. This is Annabelle Lecter. Yes. And joining us is the return of Barbie Wilde of Hellbound, an author of the Venus Complex, and now Voices of the Damned. It's a pleasure to be here. It's a pleasure to have you here. Oh. <laughs> Yes. So Voices of the Damned, um, it comes out in paperback very soon here in uh, in April. But it's yes. it's been out now. What's what's uh what's been the reaction uh for the book? Well it's b I I'm I must admit I I've, I've been very um chuffed as the British say about the reaction. One thing was that the book got reviewed by Publishers Weekly. It got a mm -hmm. starred review, which is one of their top you know, their big recommendations and it was you know they gave it a great review and I I was really I was surprised it accepted it for review because you know my publisher is an independent publisher he's not a big publisher and they very rarely review independent publishers and they gave it a great review and because the, the Hellbound Hearts anthology which had my first short horror story in it Sister Celise which starts this collection um, they gave a terrible review to Mm -hmm. When that came out in 2000 and e when was it 2009 um so i was just stealing myself to you know a bad review and that was sort of the first one and it was wonderful and uh, for the most part all the reviews have been great and people have said this is their favorite collection of horror stories and uh, i think also because there are three female cenobite stories in it there's kind of a narrative arc of uh the, the adventures of Sister Celise in it too, which pe the fans of Hellraiser have liked. And if you're not a he fan of Hellraiser, you can like my disgusting zombies or the <laughs> um, <laughs> the really filthy vampire story or the um, ridiculous writer's block, which always I always love. So um, that it's just been a wonderful reaction. I've been thrilled, and also because each story is accompanied by. This has been a bit of a dream project for me because I thought when I have a collection out, I'd love to have every story illustrated by a great artist from the horror genre. And that's what's happened. It's mm -hmm. even the paperback has got full color illustration of each story that accompanies each story by people like Clive Barker, Daniel Serra, Nick Percival, who did the Hellraiser Bo uh, Boom comics. So uh, it's just been wonderful seeing these artists interpret my stories mm -hmm. as well. It's like a, a double whammy. Yeah. Is there any reason for the order of the stories? Did, did you, uh, you know, why they're ordered the way they are? Um, well, <laughs> that's so difficult. If you, you know, because each of these stories was pretty much written in its own time, if you like. Um, I, somebody says, hey, Barbie, you want to submit a story to my anthology about demons or, you know, about phobias or about these all happened over the years. And so to put an order into it, it it's like, oh, wow, how do I, I sort this out? But I figure, well, the Sister Celeste was the first one and it's about a Cenobite. So that seemed to be the natural to be. And because there are three of them, I thought, let's space mm -hmm. them out one in the beginning, one in the middle, and one at the end. Uh, the next one is Zulu Zombies, which is just a personal favorite of mine. And I thought, well, you, you have something that's kind of weird and eerie, like Sister Celeste, you follow it with, you know, a rollicking mm -hmm. gore master roller coaster of, you know, the zombie vomit and sex. Yeah, um, <laughs> that's fun. just totally over the top. Uh -huh. <laughs> but no, it was tough. It was tough. But also, it's like, because there's so much... Um, erotica in there i had to sort of balance okay <laughs> I, you know you have to do zombie rape and you have aliens and you all these other things you have to sort of sort out you know i had to go through the stories and make sure there wasn't too much repetitive description <laughs> of certain uh -huh, acts uh -huh. <laughs> um but you know <laughs> zombie rape vampire rape <laughs> alien rape uh, Demon rape. So, so right you know, I was uh, the other day. <laughs> yeah, it's a common, really? it's a common, well, there's yeah. a whole other genre of uh, of sexy monster books. I I don't think they're quite the same caliber. <laughs> no, I don't believe um, so. Monsters made me gay. 
When there's also <laughs> like, oh, they're hilarious though. Well, I haven't read them in full, but no. just reading the, the descriptions, the descriptions on Amazon, whew, it's hilarious. <laughs> not not quite up up to your level. No. But, oh, but thank you. <laughs> well, there, there's one sort of slightly complainy um, guy. Bless him. It was a good review, but he said, "Oh, I think this book has got too much sex in it." <laughs> and I was thinking, can there ever be too much sex? I mean, that's just you know, I don't go out to write stories with sex in mm-hmm. them. But obviously, it's all part and parcel of being human, which is why I was interested, you know, with the Venus complex of writing the sexual mindscape of a serial killer, because he must think about sex, mustn't he? Mm-hmm. So, but the, to me, it's all part of being human or being a demon or being a vampire. Is that Obviously, they have to procreate or do something some way, which is why I like to explore these themes. But there, there are some stories that don't have sex in them, like Polyp. I can't mm-hmm. imagine sex in that one but um no it was sort of you know thought about um i actually did the thing about you know just printing out the artwork and putting it you know on a big surface and sort of doing a david bowie william burroughs shuffle of of the thing seeing what makes the most sense you know because william burroughs used to shuffle words around to make sentences and david Mm -hmm. bowie used to do the same with lyrics and i thought well if I shuffle this artwork around, maybe I can get some coherent thought about what would be the best um, um, order for the stories. Mm-hmm. I think I, I think it's a pretty good order I, now. And also, yeah. you know, some of the artists have two artworks, like Danny, Sarah, Sarah did uh, Valeska and Writer's Block. So I had to make sure they weren't too close together as well. Mm-hmm. So. Mm-hmm. Uh, you just mentioned Zulu Zombies, and uh, when I was reading that one, uh, it really felt like uh, like like a, a book version of like Evil Dead Two or Dead Alive, just like it was really manic and like uh, very comedic and dark. But it's definitely like uh, something I could see as like a crazy uh, film. Oh, I'm writing the screenplay. Really? It's taking oh, nice. me, yeah, it's taking me a lot longer. I've actually finished the screenplay, but, you know, I thought, hold on, there's got to be more stuff in there, because <laughs> it's not very long at the moment. But um, the it absolutely would make a wonderful film. And I'd love, you know, a, a studio like Hammer, you know, who did the the uh, woman in, lady in lady, white. Uh, or, yeah, yeah. That, you know, mm-hmm. the recent um remake of that uh it would be perfect for them because it's got that kind of vibe to it but i mean the story you know i don't particularly like zombies that much i know a lot of people in the horror world are you know huge fan of zombies Mm -hmm. but i i'm i'm not and so i was given the letter z or z to do this anthology i thought oh my god what am i gonna write that starts with a z (laughs) and and my friend said, well, you know, they're zombies. I said, well, I'm not really interested in zombies. He said, ah, yes, but you have your own unique voice. So, you know, then I, I one of my favorite films is Zulu. Mm-hmm. I think it's a fabulous story. So that was the, the, um, the actual screenplay starts in Rourke's Drift and uh, in South Africa right after the battle. And uh, it's... You know, an extraordinary story, which, of course, now, you know, uh, it, one would say, oh, no, the horrible colonialism of the Brits coming into South Africa and stuff like that. But at the time, it was just 150 soldiers against, what was it, 4,000 or 6,000 Zulu warriors. And they managed to survive. It's not like they beat them or anything, but mm-hmm. they held out long enough so they had to go off someplace and and um, actually eat breakfast that's why they left. It wasn't the matter of, you know, the Zulus just were in confusion. They just felt they had to go and eat something, and they didn't win over these guys. So, but uh, anyway, this is the uh, the beginnings of that story, and then it just—I don't know where these things come from in my head, to be honest. <laughs> you know, two girls after us, you know. A, a hen party get on a train and they're attacked by zombies or something. So I don't know where this comes from. I sort of, I'm, I'm channeling some obscene demon imp in my brain. <laughs> well, how often do you have to hold yourself back? You have these thoughts in your brain and you go with it and you write it down. But how often do you have something come up and you think, I can't do that? Does that ever happen? No. <laughs> <laughs> you, you've read the Z- Venus oh, yeah. Complex. <laughs> yeah, it, it's wonderful. Yeah. 
Uh, but no, I, I think there was a bit, I was reading it out to this friend of mine who was the dominatrix. Who's, she was the one who said, you know, my, her greatest dream was to sleep with a serial killer, which was, gave, gave me the idea for the Venus complex in the first place. And I was reading her out that chapter. I thought she'd be amused where Michael is dreaming that he's in this hospital and his ex-wife comes in and she's got filed teeth and stuff and hideous things happen. And she was like going, oh my God, I didn't know you were writing a horror novel, you know, but it just comes to me. Mm -hmm. And I don't know where it comes from, but I think the time to edit is after. Yeah. You put it down on the page and then if it fits, you know, then, or not, then you can edit yourself. But I never think, oh no, I mustn't write that or anything. And, and luckily both um, my publishers have been, oh, yeah, that's fine. There's no reason why we should cut that scene of, you know, disgustingness out, you know, um, which is wonderful. It, it's, uh, they both understand me. Uh, <laughs> that'd be a problem with them. But um, no, I, I think that you have to give your imagination a full reign. And, and when you read it back, and I do that sort of obsessively, you know, if, I, if there's something in there that doesn't work, then it's it's gone. Mm -hmm. But if it works for me, then I figure somewhere out there they work for, you know, a reader, mm -hmm. even if it's just one. So I think it's kind of very difficult to edit yourself. I think that's, um, I don't know. I, I was talking to, I was on a writer's panel with Paul Kane and Ramsey Campbell, and he was saying that he, the most fun he had when I think he was, writing for smaller presses and he said they they just you know they let you write what you want but if you're with a big press they're very concerned about um how the general public will perceive mm -hmm. and so uh i guess kind of like hollywood makes these really safe films and they're cautious about ratings and what they want to present and what they don't and independent yeah. stuff is just fantastic i i'm still amazed you know you think about basic instinct right that mm -hmm. ever got made how did that film ever get made with michael douglas yeah you know because it's a pretty sexy film for a mainstream hollywood mm -hmm. film. probably because michael douglas was in it yeah well <laughs> exactly you know he loved the idea yeah. but you know i just wa rewatched mad max again and for all the you know, we can sort of rail on about Hollywood and stuff, but that is an outrageous film. Mm -hmm. And it's it's uh, very violent, and, and the imagery is astonishing. And they, they, of course, it took a long, long time to, um, to get it to the screen. But, they, you know, sometimes they do come up. But, you know, of course, it's, it's a lot of it is very, very safe. And funnily enough, what I find interesting is how much more adventurous stuff is coming through TV now. I agree hundred percent. Yeah. You know, and, and, you know, Penny dreadful and I've, I haven't seen much of American horror story, but I understand it's fantastic and walking dead and all these kind. Oh, Hannibal, my God, mm -hmm. you know, of course that was unfortunately canceled, but, um, you know, I still am, you know, taken aback by some of the wonderful imagery and but also it's humor too, and uh, I think people get uncomfortable when you mix the little genres of oh this is horror but we're looking at it in a kind of ironic way, and yeah. uh, people don't quite get irony sometimes. And but I think there are a lot of daring things happening in the in TV. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think so. The last uh, ten or fifteen years has been like a golden age for uh, for television shows. I think it's kind of started with 24, didn't it? I'll never forget seeing, uh, there's some really tough scenes in the first couple series of that. Mm -hmm. And it was, you know, it, the um, Kiefer, Kiefer Sutherland, oh God, what's his name? Sutherland. Yeah, Kiefer Sutherland. Yeah, Ke Kiefer Sutherland, yeah. You know, he's a movie actor who's, okay, a lot of movie actors moved back into TV mm -hmm. and stuff like that, of course. But it seemed like, wow, you know, he's doing TV, TV how interesting. And so, you know, it was very violent and, um, and uh, it, it seemed to be, you know, crossing new boundaries into what could be acceptable. And I suppose with people like HBO and not having a... Yeah, like Sopranos and The Wire. Mm -hmm. and exactly. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. But twenty four um, was on regular, you know, television, not on pay cable. So yeah. 
Yeah, but I think of you know so the ones that are on HBO obviously mm-hmm. can go further. Mm-hmm. Oh yeah. Uh, but uh, you know, I've just gotten finally after years getting into the whole Scandi noir stuff. I don't know if you guys have seen any of that over in the states. No, I oh. haven't. Anyway. Oh, there's this. Well, they've done an American version called The Bridge. Right. Hmm. Oh, my mom watches that. And this is uh, the bridge. It was originally Danish and Swedish cooperate, um, you know, co-production. And this dead body of a woman is found on this amazing bridge that's really long, and it it connects Denmark and Sweden. And they, it's right in the, you know, so the Swedish detective who has Asperger's, very interesting. Mm-hmm. Uh, she says, "This is my case," and the, you know, the easygoing. Danish guy says, and then they discover that it's the top half of the body is this Swedish counselor, and the bottom half is the bottom half of a Danish prostitute. Wow. <laughs> this has already captured my imagination. <laughs> it's just <laughs> one of the best things I've ever seen. Now, I think they've done an American version that takes place on this bridge between Mexico and America. Mm-hmm. And so it's a Mexican detective and an American detective working a case. But it's, I can't recommend it highly enough. Absolutely fabulous uh, stuff. IMDb, um, IMDb page is open and will remain open until it Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so, there's, you know, there's all this good stuff happening in, in Europe as well as America. Mm-hmm. Um, so that that would be... You know, the ideal thing is is getting something happening. You know, I, I'd love to see a TV series made of the book, say, oh, Voices wow. of the Dam. You know, sort of like, you know, the style of Night Gallery or mm-hmm. Twilight yeah. Zone or any of those kind of things, you know. Um, and also, there's so much more horror on TV now, isn't mm-hmm. there? It's great. And, and there's not many shows anymore that are one-off stories. They're almost all, um, you know, one, yeah, one ongoing uh, story arc. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But you see, that's that's what I loved about the Twilight Zone and Night Gallery and Outer Limits. That they yeah. all had these like little, you know, each episode was a different story, and you had some of the best people in the world writing them too, and starring in them. There is always yeah. great guest cast. Yeah, yeah. So uh, uh, of course, back in those days, they were just starting out. You know, Robert Culp went on to do. Um, you know, great TV series and stuff, but he was in one of my favorite um, Outer Limit episodes, The Demon with the Glass Hand. I think mm. that was him. Um, oh, no, what if I've made a mistake? Uh, <laughs> I don't know if you guys have ever seen those old episodes. Yeah. That's what I, I grew up I haven't seen as on. many Outer Limits as I have Twilight Zone, and well, there was another one, too. But Yeah, I'm a big uh, – uh, I, I really like both of them. Uh, Outer Limits is more of like uh, creature stuff, but uh, – uh, I enjoy both of them quite a bit. Yeah, it's just as soon as that that the titles came up. Actually, did we think talk about this the last time we were talking? I remember mentioning this to somebody, but um, I think it's because it. You know, my brother, bless his cotton socks, made me watch all these scary movies when I was a kid. So it made me into this rather sort of fearful child, but it certainly got my <laughs> imagination going. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. So that's really interesting because when I was a kid, I got I got freaked out by, by horror movies. And I remember seeing Medusa and Clash of the Titans scare the hell out of me. But now I love it. So at what point do you transition from being creeped out and then really just going for it all the way? I don't know. I don't know. It's strange, isn't it? I think it is a, the fascination. I mean, we, we're all still, you know, fairly, you're all still sitting around the campfire telling stories to m- scare us more than the saber-toothed tiger that might be, you know, lurking in the shadows. And, mm-hmm. and I think it is a very basic, um, the whole storytelling thing is it's a basic need of humans, I think. And, uh, you know, when you're a little kid, these kind of movies really, um, I, I mean, I still can't watch Invasion of the Body Snatchers, the original 1950s version. Yeah, I, I, It was on TV recently, and I, I was just looking at a computer game, and 
<laughs> my partner said, aren't you going to watch the movie? And I said, no, because I'm too scared. <laughs> because this movie scared the shit out of me um, when I was a kid. It was this, you know, the pods. It was like the parents put the pods under the bed. You know, mm-hmm. you couldn't trust your parents. I mean, that's the basis of another story: is botophobia, fear of basements. That's my childhood basement I'm writing about. And there was a locked room. Wow! In our basement, we couldn't go into. You know, and. Um, and when they opened it up and took stuff out, there was just this little Victorian baby carriage there. Oh. <laughs> Which oh, is no. so <laughs> creepy. Um, but no, there was no dead cat in it. But, um, and I always bugged my dad. I said, can't we have a, um, it was all during the time when it was the Cuban Missile Crisis. And I said, can't we, you know, build a, a bomb shelter? And he said, what's the point? We'd have to live in it for 30 years. Better to just fry in an instant in a nuclear holocaust. Uh, so I'm like, can. yes. <laughs> but these were not words that were comforting to me. <laughs> so, <laughs> you wanted to hear about hiding under your desk. <laughs> <laughs> no, I wanted my bomb shelter. I wanted a pony and a bomb shelter, and I didn't get either of them. So um, he was just so scientific, and he just no, no. So I mean, that's why my you know botophobia is a, is a, my homage, if you like, to to all the fifty high you know sci-fi movies that scared the poop out of me when I was a kid, <laughs> yeah. you know, right. especially Invaders from Mars. Mm-hmm. Right. Um, mm-hmm. And uh, again, because it's a kid and he sees his parents being taken over by Martians, you know, mm-hmm. it's just this parent you can't trust anyone. Um, I love that, uh, the newer one, too, that I saw when I was uh, pretty young. Is that the one it's with smart. Karen Black in it? I think it is. The Invasion of yes. the Body Snatchers? No, this is Invaders from oh, Mars. okay. Yeah, they and remade it. Easy, the woman eats a frog, and that Ooh. scared the hell out of me. Oh, oh, there's a teacher, and you see the back of her, and the kid comes into this room, and it's kind of a darkened room, and she turns around, and she's eating one of the lab frogs, and it's just, whoa. Because it's just, <laughs> okay, the body is, it takes up the whole space of her mouth, and legs are kicking around. Oh, <laughs> oh, no, I haven't seen that version of it, because to me, the, the, the black and white one, which was on TV Saturday afternoons, <laughs> it was just, to me, that was, because the brilliance of that one was that everything is shot from the kid level. So when yeah. he goes into the police station, everything is, you know, the police guy comes over his desk and it, he looks like he's on top of the Empire State Building and stuff. And it's just, it's actually quite brilliantly shot, except you can see the monsters, you know, are wearing suits and the, you can see the zippers in the back of their <laughs> the ah, monsters. <laughs> no big deal. I grew up on old Doctor Who, so to me, it just, I think it, it helps your imagination work. But you see, I never even noticed the zippers, but I was reading uh, um, a little bit of trivia about it. And when they get sucked down to where the Martian ship is, you know, the, the doctor, the pretty lady doctor and the, the scientist and the little kid, they're running along this hallway. And, and it's like, it's kind of disgusting because it, it looks like, you know, these bulbous shapes are on the, the hall. And they discovered, they basically just blew up balloons and stuck them on this corridor. <laughs> But as soon as everybody ran past, they'd wiggle around and they break. So they used they used condoms, and they blew up the condoms and then painted them and stuck them on, and they were much hardier. <laughs> <laughs> See the ingenuity. I like that. I like uh-huh. hearing about people just putting this stuff together, just making it work. Now, and I know some people still do that stuff, especially at the independent level. But hearing about that, just the creativity that would go into things like this that aren't just readily available somewhere. You can't just go to prop shop and get something whipped up. You just had to figure it out. Yeah, I know. I mean, that's why I love all those, uh, you know, it's just, you know, hearing about, you know, how they had two guys who'd always open the doors for the Star Trek, you know, in the 60s. And mm-hmm. sometimes they wouldn't open them in time. So you've got these, like, you know, blooper reels of, you know, William Shatner running full tilt to the door and <laughs> bouncing back, you know, and then coming up and effing and blinding at these guys, you know, because they just didn't move quite quick enough. And But it, it's, um, no, it's, a, it's wonderful about the ingenuity of, of um, 
Well, I think a lot of that was, you know, in evidence with with Hellraiser too. That all the f- effects were practical. Yeah. And so they had to come up with certain things that, of course, you know, the makeup and stuff, those were, you know, prosthetic makeup, those were time tested uh, techniques and stuff. But say the glue that glued our, say, Doug and mine, Ken's makeup was developed in Vietnam. Mm. It's a surgical glue that they would use to pour into wounds and press them together. And then the, uh, airlift the guys from the field to the hospitals wow. and yeah I I said, that out. yeah exactly well it was kind of based on a kind of super glue idea yeah. but obviously something that wouldn't be toxic to the body yeah and uh, i just thought wow that's an interesting you know genesis or narrative arc of glue <laughs> yeah know, it's actually saving lives too sticking bits of rubber onto <laughs> actors <laughs> But so. Back to the basement real quick, because I'm a very creepy basement myself. What? <laughs> yeah, you mentioned the cat dead in the cell. It's not a cat. It was. A I rat. know. Was I was going to embarrass Neil by mentioning he's had a dead rabbit plastered to the floor of his basement for years now. When a his dead brother rabbit. Uh, yes. Now you make me sound like I'm a. Like yes, because that's how that is the perception, Neil. <laughs> because it is a messed up thing. And you need to be shamed into scraping it up. He still hasn't picked it up. He told this story and it freaked me out. Then shared it with his brother on air, and he he had to go silent on that one. His own brother. And it's <laughs> so still how there. Did, how, how did it die? I don't know. It's just uh, it's just there. I noticed. Well, I did notice a weird uh, the odor once, and I oh, thought something God. died somewhere in the basement. I didn't know where. And then uh, it was like weeks after that, uh, or probably months. And uh, I notice it. It's just like the pelt and like the tail. You can see the tail clearly. And he's kind but he of... must be fairly mummified by now. Yeah, yeah, well, yeah. It's like roadkill. It's like an old roadkill. It's flat. Yeah, I don't he's, know. If he I... shared a picture. I don't think it helped his cause. Because <laughs> <laughs> it's clearly accessible, where you could just get it and pick it up, and you know, get a shovel and throw it away. Yeah, well, it adds a character, I think, to the uh, to the yeah. basement. But uh, <laughs> yeah. uh, I I I I would would possibly say that it might be time now <laughs> to give the poor rabbit a decent burial. Uh huh. Yeah, I don't know you something know, else just brought just him down. Dig there? a little, get the popsicle ki- sticks, and make a little cross, <laughs> like we all did as kids, right, uh-huh. with the goldfish, uh-huh. <laughs> and then. <laughs> and then you know, just give it a little. I've got two stories to tell. One was one of my. Um, sadly, it's really strange. Actually, one of my goldfish committed suicide. I think it's because my. <laughs> oh man. Sorry to laugh. About yeah. That. Oh, it was just terrifying. It just jumped out one day, and I found it under the to- under the toaster, not in the toaster. I think wow. it, you know. I, my mother used to clean the goldfish bowl, and she stuck it under a tap, and just would run the water and sluice her hand, and the little. Goldfish were still in there. Wow. And I said, so Mom, what are you broken. doing? <laughs> and she said, it's okay, darling. It's the only exercise they get all week. <laughs> <laughs> so it's like taking the dog for a walk. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So when that one died, we had a full burial in the back garden. And then the second one died. And I said, Mom, where's the, where's the goldfish? She said, it died. What did you do with it? Well, I put it down the carburetor. <laughs> And I went, that's not very nice. We gave full burial rights to, you know, uh-huh. Clyde. Why not you Melvin? Can't, right. You can't set a precedent like that and then totally disrespect the next one. Uh, I, I, well, I think she, she just got tired of the whole thing. But a friend of mine's <laughs> guinea pig died. And um, this is the second story. And they had a full burial out there. He was 10, weeping copious tears. Because little Chucky shuffled <laughs> off the mortal coil, and he, he they put his dad very gently put little whatever his name was on the shovel and was about to give him a little into the hole, and it woke up. Wow! It was hibernating, <laughs> and my friend said it was actually one of the most life changing moments <laughs> that he nearly buried alive his beloved pet. It was just almost too much to bear. But um, there you go. There's my two pet burial stories. Nothing compared to Stephen King, but there you go. <laughs> so, so. But no, I think your rabbit needs the, the popsicle treatment. Uh-huh. And, the, and you know, in the backyard, under a tree, 
put a couple carrots in there so when he goes on his little <laughs> journey, he can. <laughs> so, Neil, can you be convinced now? You've heard it from many of us. Uh-huh. You got to get rid of this rabbit. If Barbie Wilde herself is telling you. Uh-huh. Mark, it's it's time. a kind way, mm-hmm. you know, take it. It's the rest of us who just scrape it up. Yeah. But, but see, how yeah. long has he been there? How long has it it's been there? It's been a couple years now. Years. Oh, years. oh, my God. So basically you're not worried about bugs or worms No, or it's anything. past that past point. That. Yeah, yeah. Oh. Yeah, it's, yeah. it's horrifying. <laughs> Even for someone that likes scary movies. this is That's like serial killer stuff. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well... My original well, thought was I, I wasn't going to go that route. I was just wondering uh, why the, why the room was <laughs> locked in your basement. I'm sorry, what? Why was the room locked in your basement that had the? Oh, the because um, the the landlord had a bunch of his stuff in there, mm. and one day they came and took it away, and the only thing they left behind was the little Victorian children's, oh. you know, um, baby carriage. That but I didn't even want to play with it because it just looked too creepy. Oh, hell no. Why did they leave it? They take everything else, they leave yes. that. There's a reason. Exactly. Exactly. You know, I still have bad dreams about that basement. And I haven't lived there in like 30, 40 years or something. You know, there's certain places that you still dream about. That house. Oh, boy. You know. And it was a nice house, but it was just this unfinished basement. Mm-hmm. And... um that room that just was, you know, caused so much confusion in my little brain. <laughs> going, what is in there? Did you think more about monsters or ghosts <clears throat> or something else? I don't know. I mean, my whole childhood basically was a wash in in worrying about aliens and monsters and big spiders and, um, you know, I give the little, you know, thing about spiders as well in the story. Um, that's a really personal story. I probably shouldn't be saying this. Oh, but yeah, you know, I do have a problem with basements. Every time I watch a horror movie and someone goes, "I'm going to go down in the basement," you guys go upstairs. I go, "No, no, 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 <laughs> Just don't go down there." So, but it, it's, um, I don't know. What was the question? <laughs> <laughs> it was something about you telling an inappropriate embarrassing or or perhaps funny story of the basement. <laughs> nah, you can... so you, <laughs> you mentioned that story, you know, being personal to you. Uh which yeah. is like which is the most personal story out of uh, the voices of the dam for you? Well, <sighs> One has to be careful. Oh, no, I do all my research, and there's nothing personal about these stories. It's just my imagination, stuff like that. Mm-hmm. Of course, you know, the fact is I did base this the basement in Botifobia mm-hmm. on my own basement as a child growing up. My father didn't end up murdering my neighbors <laughs> and putting them in, you know, whatever. Right, right. So, no, he was actually a very nice person. So uh, I would say that's that as far as my childhood fears, Botifobia is definitely a very personal tale. Um I think, you know, because, you know, I feel very personally fond of Sister Celise simply because that was my first horror story. Mm -hmm. Because I don't really consider The Venus Complex a horror novel. It's a dark crime novel. But Mm -hmm. now people are saying, well, because it's a serial killer, it is horror. So Sister Celise, and also writing in the world of, you know, Clive Barker and stuff, that was very interesting. I think personally, I think the frustration of a writer is definitely, uh, I think, writer's block. Is uh, there's a lot of you know, rage and anger <laughs> mm-hmm. coming through in that one. Um, I think right off the top of my head, actually, let me look at the table of contents. <laughs> Obviously, um, <laughs> Zulu zombies is not a personal story. Um, uh-huh. I, I think, interestingly, although you know, I've never had horrible anything horrible like that happened to me. I think my, my, one of my fears is home invasion. Mm -hmm. And so I was asked to write a story beginning with you for phobophobia. And I, I, the only one I could come up with was uranophobia, which is fear of the God of the sky or fear of the sky. But I managed to turn it into a fear of home invasion Mm -hmm. because that's what I really wanted to write about. But there isn't a phobia called that. Hmm. So that, that, no, 
that's don't amazing. You think that's a, isn't that the, the only one that's close? Is I can't remember the actual word, but it's a fear of strangers. No. Yeah, not even of, close. Fear of stranger coming into your house when they know you're in there. Yeah, that there's so is, many horror movies about that. You'd think for sure someone would have figured that out by now. Invent it right now. <laughs> it's just, oh, but so that one, you know, that was a sort of a personal story in that I thought, okay, if I was really scared, you know, I'd build a safe house, I'd do safe room, da da da. But then you hear somebody coming down. And the worst fear is realized. There are people in your house. What do you do about it? Do you stay cowering in your safe room? Or do you come out and get your horrible revenge? You know, it's, it's um, you know, that that is kind of, you, we all imagine, imagine we'd like to be heroes, you know, if we ever had to confront something hideous. Mm-hmm. Um I don't know if I would. I'm only five foot two, so I don't know how much I could damage I could do by punching someone in the kneecap. But um, you know, it's that that's sort of again, it's a fantasy based on a very personal fear. Mm-hmm. We're watching a great uh, new movie called Decay that has a home invasion in the beginning. It goes it goes in other places. It could be an inspiration mm-hmm. for you. Yeah. What, what was it called again? Decay. Decay. Oh no, I haven't heard of that one. It comes it's, out. It's in fantastic. April. Yeah. I haven't finished it yet, but uh, I'm about a half hour in, and so far, it's. I think you dig it. It's very. It's very psychological. It's about this guy who has mom problems, and he's a creep, and and stuff. And I don't want to get into it because stuff happens so quickly in the beginning. But I'm quite enjoying it. Hmm. You know, it's it's funny though because when you do have these fears, it's like the last thing you want to look at. It, it's it's because I, I was thinking about the other day how, I mean, my partner doesn't like to watch horror movies, and I don't particularly like to watch them on their but they're my own. So, mm-hmm. you know, but then I've got so much roiling around in my brain. It's almost like I don't really need inspiration. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, it's good to keep abreast of what's going on, mm-hmm. and I like doing that. Um, but I will look into it, but I don't know if you ever saw Henry portrait of a serial killer. Oh, yeah. Very nasty home invasion in that. Mm -hmm. Um, Yes. Yeah. (laughs) What an excellent movie. Oh yeah. (laughs) But yeah. Um, I'll never forget John skipped. Have you read any of his stuff? I don't think so. Oh, he's really great. Light at the end. He did that with Craig Schaefer. It's sort of a modern vampire story and it's one it was on the new york so new york times bestseller list and he's a wonderful wonderful writer but he said you know are we talking about him to about you know um serial killers and he said barbie you gotta see this movie i've just seen it. it's called henry portrait of a serial killer you're gonna yeah. love it you know so that was my basically my second date <laughs> my partner <laughs> The first film we went to see was uh, a short film about killing, which was a real laugh fest, <laughs> um, Polish film. And then we went to see Henry Portrait of a Serial Killer in this this movie cinema in King's Cross, which at the time was really a seedy area. And everybody looked like a serial killer when the lights came up, <laughs> um, except us. And I, I just sort of turned around and thought, if this guy wants to go on a third movie date with me, you know, <laughs> passes the test, but I think he want to choose. Uh, we, so you were kind of like ta- uh, Travis Bickle in Taxi Driver. <laughs> I was thinking yeah. the exact same thing. <laughs> <laughs> but no, it's 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 a great film. It's uh, not. I think I did actually watch it again. It's not. It's not one that bears too many repeat viewings. Yeah. Funnily enough, Taxi Driver is uh, that to me is a brilliant film because yeah. it really. Um, uh, you know, catches into that whole, you know, dysfunctional person and the filth that he sees on the streets and yeah. stuff, you know, it, I can, I love that film. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah. but, um, that's another one of seven. That was another one that really made a big impression on me as mm-hmm. well. As oh, far as serial killers. Yeah. Yeah. I yeah, just watched that killers. again the other day. It had been probably years, but what a, Amazing performances by everybody, but Kevin yes. Spacey, I think that was per, pretty early on in his film career. Yeah, well, this he so did excellent. he did seven Usual Suspects and American Beauty pretty much. Oh no, maybe it was it, it was more was, like uh, LA Confidential, and those mm-hmm. then he did then he did American Beauty. Yeah. Um, but no, this seven was you know, absolutely 
he, groundbreaking. He now does. everybody uses those titles, mm-hmm. you know. Yeah. But at the time, it was just like, wow, I'm scared at the at the beginning titles. He had to fight to uh, not get his name uh, in the in the opening credits or in the uh, in the commercials, and um, because he thought it would be it would be a bigger deal than w- when you see him. And uh, yes. they said that uh, he had to really fight for that because they said he wasn't a big enough star to like warrant like a big surprise. But since he had Usual Suspects, and I think it was Swimming with Sharks was coming out, he thought that since he'd come out first, by the time Seven came out, like people would know him. Yeah. Which it yeah. really worked. So. No, it, it, it was absolutely perfect. I mean, it was such a shock seeing it was him. It was absolutely brilliant. Mm-hmm. Um that's that's interesting, yeah. It's funny because Swimming with Sharks, now that's a horror movie. <laughs> uh-huh. Have you guys seen it? Yes. No, yeah. I haven't seen it. Oh, oh. I don't usually just... do shark anything. Well, Is really it like oh, no, actual no. sharks no, or no. totally not? No, no, no. It's, it's basically, it's about a guy who goes to work with a film producer played by Kevin Spacey. Oh. And and it's just the, the hideous mind games and control freakness that he... he does to this young guy and it's it just makes your tummy ache it's so <laughs> so horrible he's he's really really brilliant in it um but it is uh it's like that kind of real life horror of a, a really impossibly horrible boss mm. that you have to put up with because you're you want to do something with your life you know you want to climb up that slimy rope um, or ladder of of success in Hollywood, mm-hmm. and I I re- recommend it. It's a good film. Mm-hmm. It's not an easy ride. It's very funny. It's it's quite bitterly funny, isn't it, Neil? I seem yeah, to remember. Yeah, I it's seen a, it a dark years, comedy. But... Yeah. Yeah. I, mean, I I don't think I've seen it since it came out. But I remember you know uh, watching when it came out. Uh, I do want to mention uh, Henry Portrait of Serial Killer when we were at. Uh, is it the Murder Museum? Museum Museum of Murder. It was Museum of Death museum in of Los Death. Angeles. Yeah, and we saw the uh, the actual paintings by both the real people, both the real uh, serial killers. I actually know someone, Damian Michael, and he's going to uh, L.A. soon. And I asked him to try to snag. There's a. It was the first room we went in by accident. We kind of went in reverse, and all this art. One of the pieces was from Henry Lee Lucas, and it it's, gets me to this day. Because it's a it's a you know a normal size canvas, and it's this field, and it's cloudy like it could be stormy, and there's this thin strip of light on the horizon, and uh, the the subject is this white stallion that's very big in the front of this field, kind of running through the field, and that just gets me because I feel like that's very. It's a very sad painting of this free animal out doing its thing. And then there's this, you know, the storm, this impending storm. And then there's that little silvery, maybe that's the sky and the horizon. It just blew me away. And uh, I I want a picture of it so bad. Wow. Well, next time in L.A., I've got to go to this place. Oh, it's fan- amazing. It's fascinating. Yeah, it's yeah, they've got all kinds of, of – there was the art room, and then there was uh, different serial killer stuff. There was photographs of victims. That was very hard to look at. Um, mm-hmm. But they've got, like, the Manson family blanket. It's all <laughs> – it's like a, a like an Amish quilt, and it's all um, swastikas. Like, tiny. You don't even notice it at first because there's so – it's just this nice quilt. And then you realize, oh, that's all – Swastika's on that quilt. <laughs> My God, jeez! Yeah, this is fascinating, fascinating place. Not giant, but it's plenty to look at. You could easily spend hours there. It's fascinating. I'm ashamed to admit it, but you know, because I haven't read any sort of um, serial killer stuff for a while. But mm-hmm. there was one guy who murdered young men and buried them in in the, underneath the floorboards of his house. Gacy, John Wayne Gacy. The guy That's just- him, and he did the clown paintings. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think he gave uh, the guy who was investigating him um, from the FBI one of them. <laughs> hey, this is my clown painting from mm-hmm. the guy I, I captured. Uh, but no, it's it's just so I don't know that that kind of that's a, another thing that sort of bothers me a little bit. A clown. <laughs> 
because uh. <laughs> it's so cliched, I know. <laughs> but it's, um, uh, I don't know, I, I've never liked them. And the fact that this is a guy who actually, he dressed up as a clown too, Jesus, and mm-hmm. did kids' parties. Yeah. Merrily murdering people. Pogo the you clown. You know, in his spare time. Very mm-hmm. strange. What was the name of the guy who did the meatball one? God, that was funny. It was terrible because here's a serial killer uh, and it, he draws a step-by-step of how to kill a fat lady and and eat a meatball sub. And it's like a very, you know, like someone that's a little bit above stick figure drawings. And it's li- really a lined paper step-by-step, like first get uh, sub roll and meatballs. And it's very specific. It, it like shows all the meatballs in a line. They've all got little happy faces. And <laughs> oh, it's oh man, it's so terrible because you know he did these horrible things. But I have, I have not I had to laugh. It's so funny. I, I I must admit I have not come across that particular serial killer before, What's but there is quality? a book called Lust Mord. If you ever come across it, it's actually the writings of serial killers. Oh. And that's that's really um, – because there's one guy called Carl – ooh, Carl Panzner, I think, or something. Mm-hmm. He was like – we killed He's a, a Nazi, lot of guys. He's a uh, No, no, no. That's um, – oh, dear. My names are going. Um, no, Panzer is a kind of tank. That's what it is. Yeah, pan, pan, ram or something like that. Anyway, he he actually just killed a lot of people. But he basically this this guard at his prison said, "Why don't you just write it all down? Write, you know, maybe it'll help, you know." And so he did. And um, so it survives. This is at the turn of the last century, I think. It was quite a long time ago. But also other serial killers as well. And it's, it's, it's very interesting because, you know, you get your stupid serial killers and you get your mm-hmm. super smart ones, you know, and you get your meatball sandwich ones. <laughs> <laughs> He's a really famous one. I just can't think of his name. <laughs> yeah. Oh, what, it, wasn't, it wasn't the one that talked oh, to Oh, Berkowitz. Dog. David uh, Berkowitz. Yeah, David. That, was, that was who it was. Yeah. Oh, right. Yeah. Oh, I, didn't, I didn't. I was unaware that he did meatball sub sandwiches as, in yeah. his spare time. <laughs> it's just part and parcel of his his killing fat ladies. I guess. Yeah. Oh yeah. gosh. Terrible. Oh no, no. But the, I was just talking about this to the other day to my partner. I don't know why it came up, but again, you know, there's um. Oh, God, his name. I can't remember. He's very tall, and he murdered quite a few people. But when he was 13, he he killed his grandparents, which should have been a clue um, <laughs> think? that there was something wrong. And they let him out when he was 18, and he went to go and live with his mom, who obviously hated him for killing her parents. Mm-hmm. Um, but he used to stand in her bedroom while she was sleeping, holding a butcher's knife and all that kind of good stuff. Wow. Wow. Um, but eventually he did kill her and her friend. But it was just this little poignant moment. He cut out her voice box and threw it down the, the garburator, you know. Mm. Um, do you call that the same in, in the United uh, States? It's um, the waste gar- disposal. <laughs> sink disposal. The, 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 yeah, the sink waste disposal mm-hmm. instead of just mushed it up. And for some reason, that always makes me not laugh, but I just think, God, you finally, you can, you know, he's shut her up because I'm sure it mm-hmm. wasn't very. But no, this is obviously a horrible thing. But um, I don't know. I just found that so ironic. Mm-hmm. Um, it was just such a. <laughs> my, You'd my think he said, had to have been. Do you think he would have been an abused person? I guess people can be mentally ill and do things like that, but. Well, I mean, I mean, obviously he was, but you know what I mean? Someone that just was mentally ill without the influence of their families. Really, I think if you're like 14 years old and you manage to, you know, kill your grandparents with a shotgun, there's obviously something wrong. Yeah. And the fact that they let him out just seems strange. But, you know, it is a gest- It is making a quite a profound gesture by doing that with your mother's voice box. But, um, no, it is, uh, you know... We our our minds are such extraordinary things. You know, the same person who goes through hideous abuse as a child 
you know, so say you have someone who goes through that and they end up being a wonderful person, they don't have any problems, another yeah. person via either genetic problems or whatever has the same kind of abuse and goes on to abuse other people, yeah. you know, or become a murderer or whatever. I mean, we're all, you know, is it 8 million now? Little snowflakes are all different and, um, you know, genetic and... Uh, it sounded so sweet, didn't it? Right after the serial killer stuff. We're all little snowflakes. <laughs> Including the serial killers. Exactly. Including the serial killers. But we're all so different, and everybody has yeah. different experiences, and who knows? Mm-hmm. You know, different problems with their brain. Um, so, uh, I mean, I, I just wonder why, you know, somebody who's, you know, I'm a small blonde person and I'm about to post some picture up on Facebook of me with bunny ears because it's Easter, right? Yes. Holding my disgusting book full of erotic horror. (laughs) And I think, well, no one would cast me as a horror writer. If I was going to cast myself, I wouldn't do it, you know. Mm -hmm. Uh, But inside, who knows what, what, you know, weird things that happened to me as a child would churn around and turn out stuff like I turn out. You know, it's all, you know, luckily I channel all my rage and anger through my stories and my writing. Mm -hmm. Um, But I think even then I probably wouldn't have, you know, I wouldn't want to go and do anything. But um, yeah, it's 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 interesting how we all end up turning out. It's like you were saying, you know, you have this stuff that scares you as a kid, but in the end, you you love it. So, do you like being scared? Then it depends on like- what it is. Because I don't. I live by myself, and I so I don't like ghosts. And I never liked ghost things because I always felt like well, not always, but many of the houses I've been in, I I get creeped out by stuff like that. Well, and like aliens too, because there's nothing you could do about that. If a serial killer came along, at least I could try to fight. I yeah. can make an attempt. I, what am I going to do if there's a ghost or an alien? Nothing. It's just there. So if there's ghost stuff, uh, it depends on what it is. Well, Japanese ghost stuff really freaks me out. Hmm. Yeah, yeah. I don't know if you ever saw a film called The Haunting. It's in 1963. Oh, yeah. Yeah, the, the, the one with Claire Bloom and Julie Harris is the one. Mm-hmm. I, they did a remake with Liam Neeson and no, no, Shane, no, you know, right. awful thing. Yeah. But that still... You know, there are moments in that. And Mm -hmm. that's the one thing I haven't, I don't think anyway, off the top of my head, that I've ever done. And I will be writing a ghost story for um, an anthology later this year. Mm -hmm. I've never written a ghost story. Hmm. Um, But I think, you know, even as humans, we haunt each other. Uh, So I think it's it's interesting, you know, the concept of of ghosts and stuff. Uh, But... I don't know. I, 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 do, am I scared of ghosts? No. I, I, you know, uh, if I go into a house, um, a friend of mine actually was looking for apartments and they walked into an apartment and both he and his partner looked at each other and said, we don't like this place. We got to leave. Mm-hmm. And he said, he is not a fanciful person, mm-hmm. but he said there was something there. And he said, if I was going to believe in something, I might believe in ghosts, but certainly we both felt something yeah. really bad had happened in this flat, you know, and we just got out of there as soon as we could politely could. Mm-hmm. This apartment is next door to someone. Um, I had a friend that lived next door to me that, that ended up getting me into this place and they had covered the kitchen with rug because there was blood stains on the floor from a murder that they couldn't get out. And then another apartment, my actual apartment um, found out in the process of getting the apartment that there had been below that apartment, uh, someone noticed that there was a water stain on their ceiling and it got bigger and bigger and bigger because in my apartment, there had been an old man who died in his chair and <laughs> melted into the floor. Oh, so. no. <laughs> Ew. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, and that human body flat, that's just a dickens to get out. You yeah, know, it did never that human body flat. that much. It oh. never, in the summertime, it never came back to haunt my nose. But, uh, oh. yeah. 
Eee. Gross. But you know, it's it's funny though. I I I should you know I'm just a fat liar because that basement. I thought there's something in this basement. You know, mm-hmm. I never I never wanted to go into that basement by myself. I think that that places can get haunted. That sometimes bad things can leave a residue, or you know, if somebody dies violently, that kind of anger possibly can resonate. You know, we don't know what makes up our universe. You know, there could be dimensions beyond dimensions that we're totally unaware of. That's why I like that film. Um, you know, I'm having a really bad time tonight remembering anything. I'm looking now at the DVD. It's called Interstellar, right? There's a movie called Interstellar, and it it sort of deals with this idea that there's, you know, had Matthew McConaughey in it. And, you know, this idea of uh, sort of different dimensions and stuff. That's Mm. spooky. How about aliens in another dimension? Well, there's a movie, (laughs) probably not as uh, as classy as that one, called Event Horizon with Sam Neill. And (gasps) and I love that movie. And it gets into, like, the alternate universe, demons and... In space. Well, somebody said said that was really Hellraiser in space. It's one. I know there is a Hellraiser in space film. I can't mm-hmm. remember what it's called. Part four. But um, bloodline is, it, is that the one? Yeah. Part four. Yeah. Um, but uh, yeah, that that film was very disturbing. I I thought it was beautifully done, very effectively done. Yeah. But um, e. Anyway, so what scares you, Neil? Um, well, actually, I don't want to sound, uh, really nothing really scares me. I was watching horror movies since a little kid, but I do like movies that, like, are disturbing. I think that's why I like, uh, Solo and, uh, and a Serbian film, because, uh, not, it's weird to say, like, I like them, but I think if, if something can, like, uh, make you feel any kind of emotion, uh, I find it interesting, and those movies are disturbing on some level. It's really oh, funny because when we interviewed the guy that did Necromantic and we mentioned we enjoyed their movie, it was three German guys. That, and he was kind of like, I don't know if you'd call it enjoy. <laughs> I don't know if you enjoy that kind of movie. But what else are you going to say? I mean, they're good. Some of those movies well, are great. And joy, I guess. Joy. Do I feel joy? I don't know, but. Well, I think if, what I often say, the word I use mm-hmm. is I was very engrossed by it. Mm. It takes you in. Mm-hmm. And it's, um, uh, I, I find that that is, it's, it might be, you know, more, it was very engrossing. You know, it's like it, it, I didn't laugh or I wasn't sort of, you know, thrilled, you know, enjoying it in that way, uh, in the same way I enjoy a chocolate ice cream cone. Because you know, um, that gives me pleasure and deliciousness and all these things, but there are things that, that you know I'm totally engrossed in, and um, that to me is that if it can keep your attention. I mean, some films, some horror films, I have to say, I start watching it and I go, "Oh my god, please!" <laughs> you know, and I think, "Ah, point," you know, and it's just uh, I, I don't want to. You know, we have a half an hour rule in this house if it hasn't gripped you by the first half an hour we turn over to something else uh-huh. you know and um it's like you know there there are these real life things that i find i'm actually sitting on the edge of my seat mm. you know watching this tv series called the americans i don't know if you guys have seen that yeah with the mm. about the uh russians in the 80s and you're strangely finding yourself rooting for these Russian sleeper agents uh-huh. because they're finding themselves in these impossible situations. That, to me, is really scary. You know, I get very sort of nervous about what humans do to each other because we can be really hideous mm-hmm. to yeah. each other. And um, I think that's that's the thing. But, you know, that kind of extreme horror, like a Serbian film, you know, I've heard about it. I haven't, haven't seen it. And I haven't seen Salo yet either, I have to admit. I haven't, you know, it's almost like I, I, I need to see these films and there are things I do want to see. But... Um, there's no basements in either of them, I don't believe. <laughs> Phew. Uh, well, that'll be, that's okay, then. <laughs> There's a lot of dark places and, and, like, literally dark in a Serbian film with one scene, there's a spotlight in a room, so I don't know if that qualifies. But Sallow, there's no basements. 
<laughs> I'm so glad. <laughs> no, I might have. I might give that one a go. No, it's obviously it's there are classic ones. But, you know, it's funny because at the end of the day, when you're doing writing and stuff like this and you, you're going into dark places yourself, to mm. me, I like to go and look at palm trees or something. You know, it's... it's <laughs> It's much more relaxing. Mm -hmm. You know, tonight I'm going to be watching Blade Runner because I haven't seen that in a long time, and I love that film. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, But it's it's interesting how some people, you know, obviously there are films I have to see because I want to see what's happening on the edge of, of, um, you know, the the cutting edge stuff that's happening in the horror world. Uh, But it's it's sort of like I, I need to be inspired by my own, dark thoughts as well and it's so difficult sometimes and also i get really you know i i get i am i get sucked into films and it's almost like somebody once said it's a pity that you can't lose weight when you watch films you know that nervous (laughs) tension Uh (laughs) that's watching scary movies diet you know Uh, because i do sort of get very tensed up when i'm watching certain thrillers and and horror movies and stuff Mm -hmm. um but also I get kind of irritated as well. Like I'm saying, I'm talking to people when they're walking. You know, I think <laughs> sinister. You know, Ethan Hawke walking through his dark house with a baseball bat. You know, and I'm like going, if you think they're a home invasion. See, I, th- I was scared because I thought it was home invasion, you know. Mm-hmm. I said, y- you get your fa- family in one room, you call the police, you don't walk around in the dark <laughs> with a baseball bat. I was so angry at that film. And spoiler alert, I was thrilled when he got, got his comeuppance at the end. I felt sorry for the family. Uh-huh. But uh-huh. I thought you so deserve whatever you get because you walk around in the dark with your stupid baseball bat. Uh-huh. And you move your family into the house in the first place. Mm-hmm. But see, this is, this is why I, I shouldn't watch these movies. because I actually thought that was pretty one of the pr- most effective ones, though, because it was very, very disturbing, sinister. Mm-hmm. Um, but... It was beautifully done, too. But it had moments of irritation. I'd love to make a horror movie so I'm not sitting there going, people would never do that. Yeah. Mm-hmm. You know? I, I don't want people to be saying, I would never do that at any, you know, if I made a movie. Mm-hmm. You know? It's like when women run out of the room without taking their handbags. <laughs> never happen. <laughs> All the time I see it. (laughs) It's just, I'm sorry. You will have to cut off my hands (laughs) if I don't take my handbag with me. If there's a nuclear holocaust, I'm grabbing my handbag, you know. So, um, anyway. (laughs) I think we've digressed a bit, but it's been fun. (laughs) That's usually what happens here. Yes. (laughs) Oh, dear. Anyway. Yeah. Earlier you did talk about horror and comedy. And uh, obviously, in your stories, a lot of horror and and, uh, and sex erotica. Um, so, uh, what what's the connection between uh, horror and, and erotic? Well, I saw this TV series about horror many years ago, and this guy said, you know, a woman's face when she's at the height of orgasm, she looks like she's screaming for her life. And I thought, whoa, that's really. You know, but it's a very weird kind of connection. But I think, um, why erotic and horror? Um, I'm not quite sure. It just seems to, to wend its way into my stories. I mean, I think a lot of my stories are very funny, too. Mm-hmm. There's some, always got to be a punchline somewhere. But um, I don't know. I think it's, it's like I say, you know, if I write a story, there's going to be humans in it. And there's it's all part and parcel being human. And... Um, I don't know. Also with, with women as well, you know, the whole thing about sex is you have to let them in. If you know, it's, it's a, it's a surrender. The whole act has to be a little bit of a surrender, if you know what I mean. Mm -hmm. And so, I mean, it's, it's, I don't know, it's, it's strange, but I think (laughs) <laughs> it's funny, some, one, somebody once asked me, you know, have you always been interested in S&M or did being in Hellraiser spark this? And I thought, God, this is like, you know, being asked, when did you stop beating your wife? I'm not particularly, as a human, <laughs> interested in S&M, but the dynamics of that, you know, these kind of things interest me. So 
uh, I think it's all part and parcel of it. It's just the way I write. It's not like I'm, I set out, here's the good answer. Sorry, forget everything that's been for. Uh, I don't set out to write an erotic horror story. Mm -hmm. If I set out to write a story about two girls on a train and they bump into some zombies, it doesn't, when I start to write it, it doesn't, I'm not thinking, where am I going to throw the sex in? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That never happens with anything I write. It just comes. It's like a channeling, like I said, from my evil imp in my head. You know, that's why Paula, which is a particularly disgusting story, mm -hmm. is, is, it, there's no sex in that. I can't, you know, it didn't seem to naturally come up, <laughs> you know. So I think that, um, it, you know, this is, this is the thing. It just organically comes. And it's not something I, I analyze and say, okay, I've got to write this story, so it's got to have an erotic element. I, that's not how I work. It's Thankfully. all very or yeah, yeah. It's it's very it's very organic, and it's just it just comes out, and it's it's I've got to be. Normally, I think I mentioned this to you guys before. I, you know, just before I go to sleep, boink, the ideas start to come, and I have to write them down or I forget them, and it's it's just it's all through inspiration, and um, obviously I do research and stuff. That's really important, especially if you have writer's block. You have to research to, to have ideas pop into your head. But, you know, it's, it's not something I consciously think about. I think if I start doing things like that, that's when you lose your edge. Mm -hmm. You yeah. know? It's kind of like an act of desperation to sit there and have, okay, here's what has to happen here. And here's what, and I have to hit all these bullet points. It, it, to me, that kind of film is, sometimes they're funny or you know, kind of a mindless popcorn flicks. But for something yeah. really meaningful that's going to last, for me, it's going to be something like that. Yeah. It's, it's, one has to avoid the formula. Uh, you yeah. know, I mean, I did the Robert McKee story structure course, and I'm intensely grateful I did. It was it was really excellent. You know, I think it, it's actually showcased in the film Adaptation with mm -hmm. Nicolas Cage. It's, it's wonderful in a very funny way. But... Um, you know, it, it's, yeah, and he, we went, you know, scene by scene and almost beat by beat through Casablanca, and you realize, oh, my God, this is an act of genius, this film and stuff. But then you think, okay, I know all that now, now I go and I do what I want to do. It's, mm -hmm. it's, you know, you have to learn the rules, and then if you, then you write from the heart. It's the most, it's, otherwise, why do it? Yeah. You know, I know that there are people out there who, who, you know, they have to write in a certain way because that's how they earn their money and stuff like that. And mm -hmm. I'm hoping that one day <laughs> I will earn a huge amount of money from my writing because, it's, <laughs> you know, it's my passion and it's what I want to do. And, you know, these are the things that um, engage me and I hope they engage my readers. But I can't think about, oh, what's the formula and what's this and what's that. I think that's that. That kills your inspiration and your creativity. Mm -hmm. um, but everybody works in a different way. I mean, I have a friend who who puts everything on index cards and then on a big bulletin board in front of his, well, it used to be a typewriter and now it's a computer. You know, he maps the whole story out before he starts to write it. I like that idea. I, I would, because sometimes if I have a story idea, I get certain scenes in my head that will make sense and to keep track of that and then try to find links. Oh, sure, sure. Yeah, you know, I've got a friend of mine who just wrote a, the beginning and then the end and he had, he had a horrible time trying to get to, to the end, you know, <laughs> which is, hey, that's to me, if you've got an end, Jesus, that's fantastic, you know. But um, no, but see, uh, that's that's how they work. And but I saw this one writer who's quite famous. His name again, I can't remember. Uh, he said, "I create these characters, and then they run off, and I follow them and write their story as they run off to do their merry narrative arc." You mm -hmm. know, and I think, well, that's this because I'm really into character and the the people, and it's that the, they gather the story to them. You know, when we did this literary panel, Ramsey said, I'm all about the plot. I'm all about the, you know, the, the actual story. And I thought, well, that's interesting. He works in a very different way than, than I do. You know, and, and it's, you know, having read his brilliant stuff, you know, you can see that. But it's just everybody works in a different way. And thank goodness, you know, otherwise we wouldn't have the extraordinary, um, you know, diverse spectrum of any literary or filmic thing that we do have. So... 
Here's to individuality. Yay. Snowflakes. Yay. <laughs> snowflakes, man. <laughs> Even serial killers can be snowflakes. <laughs> uh, I didn't want to ask about uh, Sister Celise. Um, what was uh, what was the decision in, in writing uh, in the Hellraiser universe? Well, the, I was asked to, to contribute to the Hellbound Hearts anthology. Mm-hmm. And I said to, to Paul Kane, who was the editor, and his wife, Maria Reagan, I said, well, I don't really write horror. I do this crime thing at the moment and stuff. He said, oh, no, no, please. You know, it'd be so great to get a feminine, you know, especially from someone who played the female Cenobite. And then I, I remembered that Gary Tunnicliffe, who's directing the new yeah. Hellraiser um, film, Judgment, and so he sort of posited the idea that she used to be a nun. Now, I have all sorts of lapsed Catholic issues with my mom having been one. So I thought, oh, that's delicious. And this was the only short story I ever wrote that I did in a week. Hmm. It just wow. flew, flew out of me. And I was surprised because I thought, this ain't going to happen. You know, I was the first one to come back with my story. <laughs> Paul was delighted. And... Um, but it just really happened. I thought, ooh, this is cool. But it, it's the story of a female Cenobite for legal reasons. It couldn't be about my character. But, of course, mm-hmm. if you've read the Hellbound Heart novella, which mm-hmm. all the stories were based on, the lead Cenobite is a female. Mm-hmm. So that's where that sort of idea came. You know, how would that Cenobite have come to be? And in the second story, it's she designs her own box, which is basically I worked on that story with Eric Gross. Yeah. Um, who did design the beautiful box and did the wonderful artwork. And in the third one, you know, at the end of that story, I said the great rebellion of female Cenobites. And then I had to write a new story for the uh, collection. And, uh, and <laughs> you know, I had to come up with a rebellion. So that was, uh, that was probably one of the most difficult stories to write. I, it was right down to the wire as far as publication was concerned. It was the last story I wrote. But I'm very pleased with it. I think it, it ended up pretty good, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, would you release those as their own set? I would love to expand her world. I would love to see a graphic novel of Sister Elise. Yeah. And so I have been asking people, and I've got a friend of mine who's um, just got the most wonderful job working for a big firm that I can't mention. But anyway, he made some suggestions about people to approach. I mean, I'd love to see a graphic novel of Zulu zombies. I think, you know, Nick Percival <laughs> could do the most awesome cover and then, you know, do a graphic novel of that. Um, but the Silesium thing, I think would be wonderful. I'd love to expand that. Uh, and I think, you know, I know that I'm sure that Clive would be okay with it. Um, God, I've done these three stories as it is. So uh, mm-hmm. yeah, I'd love to, uh, that's absolutely on the cards is expanding that. Mm-hmm. Uh, into something more, like I said, either a graphic novel or, or uh, a novel. Yeah. Mm. The uh, the Valeska story really uh, it seemed like it was you know opened up to uh, to continuing. Well, it started out as a novel. Okay. I started writing that ages ago, and then I thought, oh gosh, it, you know, again, it's it's. Uh, distractions come along and then you have to do something else. And I, I went back to that and thought, could I turn this into a short story for the collection? And every, but the wonderful thing is everybody has said that anybody who's read the story and reviewed it, they've all said, please turn this into a novel. So that's, that's, it's wonderful because that gives me a, you know, um, confidence boost that I was on the right track and I, I, I will re- be returning to that because I think she's a great character and I think it'd be great to expand the war between the, the Seminoles and the Sanguines and you yeah. know more backstory and stuff like that so, mm-hmm. so that's definitely on the cards as well mm-hmm. uh, You mentioned uh, Gary Tunnicliffe do you have any uh, opinion on the, uh, on the new Hellraiser that's coming out? <laughs> Absolutely none. <laughs> you know why? You know, because I read Gary's interview with oh, I can't remember. It was Dread Central, bloody disgusting. I think it was bloody and then disgusting, I read yeah. Doug's interview, mm-hmm. and they both have a point. I've met Gary. I adore him. Mm-hmm. I mean, he was even talking about doing a short 
you know, uh, working with me on something. But, you know, he's got his own ideas, and that's great. I think his whole experience with Revelations was, you know, he was set to direct, and that didn't come off. And he he's not particularly happy about how that film came, came out and stuff. And so now he's at the helm. But yet again, it seems like it is just a, something to fulfill a contract. Mm-hmm. And... Um, uh, so I, I, I don't know. I, uh, we'll see how, what comes out. I, I was really hoping that if a new Hellraiser film would come out, that it would have Clive mm-hmm. having more of a, an input and Doug back in the, in his pins. Yeah. <laughs> yeah I remember but, a couple of years ago where Clive was writing about how it was going to go somewhere. I he I I I think he is writing the script. I I, I believe he is, but uh, he's got a lot of projects on. Yeah. But also, one has to remember. I mean, I actually met the guy who came up with the concept of Fury Road, Mad Max Fury Road. He was in talks with George Miller, Brendan McCarthy. Yeah. And um, he's he's I've seen his work and his you know he's a brilliant artist and. And I saw so much of him in the film again when watching it again. And I met him in 2000, right? And he was talking about this film. Mm-hmm. So, but, you know, getting George Miller on board, getting, is, is Mel going to do it? No, Mel feels he's too old. Who's going to do Max, you know? And all these things came in the way and it was dead. Now it's back. Now it's dead again. So 16 years. Wow. You know, so if there's a new Hellraiser, you know, in the horizon that might have Clive and Doug involved, you know, and he only talked about it two years ago, you know, it's, I don't know if you've seen the film Frida, but, you know, Salma Hayek was walking around with that script for six years before she finally got it done. So this is the reality of these situations, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, But I'd love to see it give, a you know, a beautiful big budget I mean, you don't have to have a big budget. I mean, the first couple films didn't have a huge budget mm-hmm. of Hellraiser, but um, I don't know. But I'm I'm going to wait and see what happens. I think that that Gary has a real unique vision, and I have no idea what the script is, but um, I think that that Doug's points were pretty valid. Mm-hmm. That he'd been involved with the film for thirty years, you know, and and stuff. So. Mm-hmm. It's it, it's a difficult one. We'll just have to see. Yeah. We had Gary but to on. Be, yeah, go on. But sorry. I've only seen the first two. To be honest, I started watching Hellraiser in space, and then it went back, and then I thought, yeah, this is interesting. But then something came up, and I couldn't finish it. But you know, I know that some people have watched all nine films. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But um, I think the the original concepts in the for one and two were probably the. Might have been the stronger ones. I I, oh, I don't know. A doubt. Mm-hmm. I can't yeah. imagine anybody out there would say eh, no, five was top notch. <laughs> <laughs> I yeah. I got to say, actually, people were real troopers to get through that series. I love Lance Henriksen. We both love. I'm sure you love Lance Henriksen as well. But he was in one of them, and it was just awful. It was yeah. So what well, does not what's terrible. not to love about Lance? Uh-huh. But no, it's just it. But here's the, you know these are the problems. You you know. Uh, it's difficult. I don't want to, you know, acting left me behind. I didn't leave acting. Yeah. You know, you get to a certain age in the business, and unless you're Meryl Streep, you know, mm. you, you have to find something else to do. Um, but I think that that sometimes, you know, you there, there has to be a point when you go, you know, this script really sucks. <laughs> <laughs> I can't do this. I mean, the, was it last year? I can't remember. I think it was last year. Oh, Maybe the year before. Oh God, it's all going funny. Anyway, um, I was offered three different films, and this is I hadn't been acted in in decades, and I turned one down because I didn't like the the I didn't like my character, but also I thought, oh, this is too cliched, formulaic. Mm-hmm. If I'm coming back, I want to be in something that's really good. And the mm-hmm. one I chose, which was you know one film fell through, and the other one was Bad Medicine, and the script was astonishing. I think we actually were talking about yeah. it. Yeah. You know, and but it didn't happen. And you made that comment. I remember actually saying, with that pitch film, you know, mm-hmm. there was nothing in it to entice me to to um, to contribute. But I think this is why they they've stopped and they're going back and they're going to be doing, you know, they haven't the idea the project hasn't stopped, but it's oh, good. just 
they're they're doing short films and building up their repertoire oh, great. Uh, uh, as a director and a producer. But it is absolutely so, you know, important to get something happening. But I think, I don't know, is the whole Kickstarter thing, you know, when you get people like, this is what we were talking about the last time too, I think when you've got Rob Zombie and Spike yeah. Lee doing yeah. Kickstarter and stuff, you've, you know, it's time to find something else to to uh, get funding from, unfortunately. I think it's hard because there's so many great projects. There's just so, I mean, we come across things all the time. You come across things all the time. There's just so many amazing things that you've really got to pick and choose. And that's tough because you've got wonderful projects. You've got the projects of friends. You, you, it's very difficult to pick and choose between them. It really is. And I think that... Um, I don't know how people do because there are so many Kickstarter campaigns out there. So mm-hmm. many Indiegogo campaigns out there and it's, it's, you know, people, you know, times are tough. Yeah. And so it's, it's difficult to do it. Yeah. And some of to, the, to f- and sometimes funding, there's yeah. uh, certain people uh, that give <clears throat> the whole thing a bad name, which is too bad. Cause I know mm-hmm. I, I don't want to say the name, but uh, I uh, I donated to one and I never got anything uh, back that I was supposed to, and you know oh, these are bad. Uh, that's so anymore. wrong. No, yeah. no, that's not good. But you know, there, there's another guy who said, "Oh, uh, send me twenty thousand dollars so I can show you how to make the perfect potato salad." That was hilarious. He only yeah, wanted five dollars. <laughs> oh, really? And he, he ended up making a hundred. <laughs> yeah, yeah, people just saw the video, and it was so funny and so over the top, ridiculous. Because he'd never made a potato salad before, and that was his real goal: was just to make a potato salad. And it just grew and grew and grew. And he made Which a is fortune. Kind of, yeah, it's kind of sad because those people could have given money to something else. But it's like watching YouTube videos. You've got these million plus views for total crap. So I it's know. the nature of human beings, I guess, to just they just give to the thing that makes them laugh in the moment. Well, you know, this is <laughs> as a friend of mine once said. You know, humans where the earth is where horror and humor walk hand in hand, mm. and I think that there's so little. It, it's some pretty horrible things happening, and if something you can find something that can give you a laugh. That's worth a fiver, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh-huh. Yep. Oh, goodness. Oh, dear. So how can people uh, f- uh, find uh, Voices of the Damned? Yes, you can find Voices of the Damned at all the Amazons and Barnes and & Nobles. Any online bookstore will be carrying it. I think Waterstones as well in the hmm. UK. You can also get it direct from my publisher. But, you know, then again, that's... Um, uh, we did have signed copies. I think there may be a few left. If you email him of the deluxe edition, you could go to SST publications, but there are only a very few left of the signed ones. Mm -hmm. Um, but mostly, you know, all Amazon, they're available as a trade hardback, full color, illustrated trade hardback. The deluxe edition is really gorgeous. That's got really deep colors, that's available as well. Kindle and as of the 1st of April, paperback. And that, again, is going to be full color and it looks gorgeous. So. Wow. Yeah. yeah. You got the bases covered. You're everywhere. I'm everywhere. The book is everywhere. <laughs> we just need people to go out and buy it and get freaked out by my disgusting six stories. Uh-huh. <laughs> <laughs> I quite enjoyed them. They're right up my alley, so. Oh, I'm so pleased. Yeah, yeah. I did. I do have to mention real quick. Our webmaster, uh, who who uh, does our great website, without your head, uh, he's from Milton Keynes. So when I, when I saw him <laughs> do the zombies, I was I had to tell him. Oh, he's got to get the book. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Maybe I should send him one just to you know as a thank you. Um, <laughs> no. Oh God. No. It's funny. Milton Keynes has got this rather sort of strange reputation. I've been there. There are lots of fake cows in the fields. It's so <laughs> odd. I, di- I did a convention there in a shopping mall with Ken Cranham. And he said, my God, darling, we're in Milton Keynes. And it's a sort of like, a, it's a bit of a, oh, I hope you don't mind me saying this, Mr. Um, <laughs> Webmaster. Tyler, Tyler, but yes. it's, it's kind of got a reputation. 
And it's sort of like, you know, you don't want to go to Milton Keynes or you, actually Sarah <laughs> Pinborough lived there, so I must be careful. But it is a strange place because it's one of those towns that were built. It's like one of those super modern towns. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And they felt they had to put fake cows in the fields and stuff. So strange. It is I would strange. want to see it, though. I'd be curious. I'd want well, to I see it. I must say, the shopping mall is fabulous. <laughs> it's actually very nice from what I can remember. Um, but, you know, it's so other places like Slough. You know, it's just the names. You know, Milton Keynes, Slough. Scunthorpe, that's another one. What? Just rolls off the tongue. You want to go there, don't you? Scunthorpe. And anybody from Scunthorpe who calls in and says, don't diss my town, um, I'm just sorry. It's just the way, yeah. the way it sounds. You've got to be used to that. I mean, come on. Yes, you exactly. There, you live there, but you just got to roll with it. Exactly, exactly. If it's a town is going to sound that sort of... Um, unattractive rolling across your tongue, <laughs> then you have to be prepared for a little bit of uh, yeah. of uh, making fun of. Yeah. I live in a town called Sandwich, so I, I can't <laughs> That's wonderful. <laughs> oh, dear. People no, no, think honestly. I'm making it up, but it really is. I remember driving through George Washington. That was uh, with the Martha Inn in Washington State. That was... <laughs> Why, why, why? It was a really horrible little town, too. Anyway, so that's where you can get my book. <laughs> that's when you can get my book. And, you know, you can keep an eye on my website, which I must update soon, or my Facebook pages, or Twitter, at Barbie Wild, to um, keep abreast of all my um, ridiculous doings. And I have to say, of the authors that we've looked at on the show read their stuff barbie is my favorite author we've had oh not just because oh. you're a great person but i really really enjoy your writing oh and well, thank you so much thank you and you know that drawing you did you were inspired by one of my stories it was beautiful you started this drawing do you remember which one was it it's, uh, it's got a is woman it, like pinned a, up against a wall and yeah it's like a creature is, uh, is having his way with her. Oh, my. <laughs> Go through your notebooks, love. <laughs> she's like, yeah. she's, she has, you have to narrow it down more than that. I mean. Yeah. Like, <laughs> creatures screwing innocent women. I don't know. Oh, anyway. No, no. But it's, uh, thank you so much. That's really a lovely compliment. And um, uh, it's, it means a lot, actually. Because uh, it's always nice to to know that you've you've managed to reach somebody, um, especially when you write stuff like <laughs> too. It's amazing. Oh, thank you, thank you. You're very welcome. Yeah. Yay! <laughs> <laughs> Suddenly, I become five years old again. Oh dear. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, dear. Well, it's been absolutely delightful being on your program, and we talked about all sorts of different things, yes. mostly basements. Uh-huh. <laughs> basements, exactly. Exactly. But I think it was one thing I remember seeing. Um, it was a Madonna video, Oh, Father, and it all was about her being a little girl and her mother dying, and, and somebody watching it with me said, oh, wow, she uses all the right stuff, mm. you know, all this stuff from – your childhood and she produces this great song. I mean, I don't know if she wrote it, but I think she co-wrote it. And I think that's what comes out in this book. There's lots of things about that. I think about deeply and back from my, you know, my own childhood that come out in these short stories and my, the, you know, the things that we're all afraid of and stuff. So, I mean, that's what is interesting for me for horror just to, you know, wind up is that it's an exploration of our our own fears, yeah. And uh, but also it always should have a sense of humor. Mm. Was it David Cronenberg said all my all my movies are comedies? <laughs> 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 or actually, you know, Alfred Hitchcock said the same thing. Really, all my movies are comedies. <laughs> you know, so it's there's always a comedic element in my mm. work, which I I think is a really important. Even if people can't spot it, so. Um, but mm. it's it's nice being with people who who appreciate and love horror because uh, 
it's a very, you know, basic and wonderful thing that's deep down inside mm -hmm. of us, and it's great to explore it. Mm -hmm. I have to say, I'll, I'll add on to my compliment that part of the reason, part of the reason that I enjoy your work is, and I don't usually do play off the woman thing, but I think it's very dangerous sometimes for a woman to express that kind of crazy sexuality in their stuff. And it's, we, it's inspiring to for me because as an artist, you know, you've seen some of the stuff and I come up with all these mad things. And But sometimes I'm like, well, should I do that? Because it's so dark. I don't know if I should put it out there. And then when I read your stuff, yes. <laughs> yes, do it. Yeah. No, no. It, it's interesting. I, I, you know, I've, I've sort of mentioned this a couple of times during um, some things I did for Women in Horror Month is that we are sometimes our wor own worst enemies. Oh, mustn't do that. Oh, mustn't do. No, fuck that. Pardon my French. You know, you have to do it. This, these are the things I want to explore. And if people are offended by it, well, go and read, you know, Twilight or something. <laughs> you know, uh -huh. it's just my, my vampires are, you know, they do other things other than drink mm -hmm. blood, mm -hmm. you know? And, it, but I, I think it, it, it's, it, because we're often too polite yeah. girls, we're taught that from an early age, mustn't grumble, but, but, mustn't be too polite. And it's very important to push those boundaries. And, you know, it's, it's um, oh, what was it? I think I, I mentioned that one of the reviews for uh, the, the Venus Complex, it's like, oh, yeah, I was given this book by the chick who played the female Cenobite. You know, oh, mm -hmm. but she can write, you know, and it's great. But it's like that, why did he have to, it was kind mm -hmm. of dismissive. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, but I he wouldn't have done that, but maybe he would to an actor rather than an actress, you know. Mm -hmm. But wouldn't but have brought it, up that this is a this is the guy, this <laughs> right. is some man, uh, like this is the, is well, the I don't know, if it, was a, if it was a woman, would he mention, would she mention like this is the hot dude from blah, 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 oh, who just well, so maybe, happened to put out this book? Yeah. Well, I think a lot of people have a, a real difficult problem grasping that people can do two things. Yeah. You know, I'm an actress, I was an actress, and now I'm a writer. And a lot of writers are sort of, oh, well, you know. And it, it is, um, it's it's one of these things you have to fight against. And I, I honestly, truly believe that, the, the, you know, a lot of people, oh, I, I'm, I hate feminism as young women. They don't know what it was like to be in the 50s and 60s and stuff, yeah. you know, and fight for every right that you have. I am a proud feminist and I don't think all men are rapists and I don't think all this <laughs> is bullshit, you know, but the fact is I do believe that we still have a long way to go. And for every, you know, brilliant folks like the Soska twins, there, are, you know, there's still only three or was it 6% of directors in Hollywood are women. We have a long way to go. Sorry. Cause we're more than 50% of the population. No, but that's why you mustn't edit yourself. You just have to keep on pushing. And I do. And I, you know, if people get annoyed at me pushing for a review or something like that. I think, well, you know, I have to, because mm -hmm. not only am I writing in a genre that's fairly misunderstood, but also because, oh no, I'm a girly and how can girlies write such horrible stuff? Easy. <laughs> <laughs> I just put on my man skin. <laughs> and I write like a man. Well, this is somebody was saying is that, oh, yeah, that's right. John Skip, actually, when he reviewed the Venus Complex for Fangoria, said, boy, if Barbie was a guy, she'd never be able to get rid of with some of the, get away with some of the stuff that she wrote about women in this book uh -huh. you know or or you know life or whatever you know mm. but i am a woman i don't ask for any special dispensation yeah but um you know i i think it's it's interesting that he he should make that comment because you know i just thought okay i'm gonna it like a character write like a guy who's a serial killer yeah it's just like another character it doesn't. It doesn't weaken it. The fact that I'm a woman, I just have to put myself in the right character and find the stuff. But anyway, who knew I'm rubbing on? But <laughs> again, no, apologizing. No, it's but no, great. I think it's good stuff to listen to. Definitely. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, no. You, you again. You must. You know. Don't edit yourself. Just put it. You know. Keep on. And you know. Don't be polite. Yeah. I was going to bring this up, but along those lines. Um, 
you talked about sexuality in in your uh, in your work, but even beyond that, there's a lot of like taboo uh, stuff, like uh, um, these people are getting raped or there's violations, but there's still uh, some enjoyment uh, on some level from a lot of the characters that these these things are happening to. And I think, uh, as Annabelle said, it's really brave to have have in the stories. Well, I, you know, I I'm not saying you know obviously rape is I a horrible that. violation, mm-hmm. you know. But as I said in the Venus Complex, you know, somebody did a study, and it turns out that it is actually the most efficient way to make a woman pregnant. I mean, hmm. how fucked up is that? If there is wow. a grand design out there, you know, what does that mean? Okay, that's just one study. I don't know if you know. I can't mm-hmm. even find it anymore. But well, it's no, still it's dark, and that someone would, it's someone would think of that to study. That's yeah. strange. Yeah. How do you put that into a, a pitch uh-huh. for a grant? Yeah. I got this great, I want a grant to study, you know, the efficiency of rape as, as making women pregnant. Oh, yeah, sure. Here's $100,000. Know? <laughs> but anyway, no, it is, um, uh, no, I, I think that there's a, a, a book I read many years ago called The Secret Garden. And it's about women's sexual fantasies and dreams. Hmm. And the, the violation, or, or was it, it's not a rape fantasy, but it's a ravishment fantasy. Mm-hmm. You know, it's like, oh, well, <laughs> you know, it's like, if I'm going to get raped, I hope I get raped by, you know, Keanu Reeves or, you know, Michael <laughs> Fassbinder or something. You know, that, that's not really, you know, mm-hmm. you know what I'm saying. But, you know, there is this kind of, you know, it's an uneasy kind of, Thing and it it all again ends up in the the interesting dynamics of, you know, S M, B D or whatever it is, and and these kind of things. Like I said, I I did know someone who's that was her business was being a dominatrix, and so you know it was I had some wild conversations with her, um, you know, and and people's sexuality. It's not just you know the missionary position. It's three hundred sixty degrees of of normality to perversion to what's, you know, somebody's perversion is another's normality. So, uh, but like I said, you know, I write about humans, so it's got to have sex in it. (laughs) (laughs) Because there wouldn't be 8 billion snowflakes (laughs) if somebody wasn't doing something with someone. So, uh, Uh (laughs) anyway. (laughs) I think we should just take that image away with us, the little uh-huh. snowflake. I of course, that so. <laughs> it, this, there are the sort of snowflakes of the burst demon at the end of Silesium Rebellion, too. I just love that idea that, that hell freezes over, if you like. Oh, no, spoiler alert. But um, anyway, so. So I'm just imagining snowflakes having sex now. <laughs> just real, oh. true snowflakes, well. they're just... Uh-huh. They Jumping could on. melt, or they get, it's like pointy, oh. they're so pointy. Ooh, could, <laughs> little snowflakes could get hurt. Uh-huh. <laughs> I was thinking of the end of the slot cracker, which Annabelle and I went and saw, and the snowflakes are coming out of the giant candy cane penis. But, <laughs> <laughs> this is a real thing. <laughs> this is not Neil's weird, <laughs> twisted fantasy. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. They're, it's strange. Yeah. If you're ever in Boston around the holidays, one time at the Slut Cracker will do you for life, but it must it, be seen. It, it What's it called? The Slut Cracker? <laughs> yes. Yeah. And it really has nothing at all to do with the Nutcracker. It's just a clever name, but uh, it's kind of, there's a, a couple and they just get engaged and they're having a, a party. And then this bombastic woman comes in the door who's friends with her and, and her gift to her is a dildo. And then the story unfolds from there. Because the the fiance, the male fiance, is not happy about it, and then it's it's ridiculous. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and it There's really no it, sense. Yeah. It's just people dancing around yeah. in sexy ways, but it's it, but it's a variety of sexy ways. Mm-hmm. And it culminates and, uh, in a giant uh, candy cane penis that erupts with and then, uh, snowflakes. Yes. And there's a man. There is a, a male dancer who was very very good this past year. And he actually is a, is the human embodiment of the dildo itself. He has a special hat. Hold on, is this uh, this such a movie? Are these people in in acting this? This yeah, is a, acting at the Somerville play. Theater every uh, holiday time. They, uh, this is a real this, performance. Is it for kids? <laughs> no, 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 definitely. Not. 
children, children at home. Not, so, not so in, age. In, in, in the UK, they have something that's called pantomime season. They have all these guys dressed up as women, mm -hmm. and there's the young girl who dresses up as the prince, and they all sort of they, they have fairy godmothers and all this sort of stuff. But this sounds like it should come to the UK. <laughs> you know, definitely the, the slut cracker. <laughs> <laughs> that, that, that's really... Um, what can I say? <laughs> I have to come to Boston for Christmas. <laughs> I think we actually saw it on Christmas Eve the first time we saw it. Yeah. It's, that's my kind of seasonal viewing. <laughs> I remember the first time I, I watched the Saska Twins movie. We watched Dead Hooker in a Trunk on Christmas Day. And it just was perfect. You know, with, um, you know, uh -huh. um, margaritas and chili because we do this anti-Christmas meal and chili it's a fine christmas meal i must oh yeah and nachos yeah it's 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 perfect it just beats those winter blues away you know you don't care if you've got enough tequila in you <laughs> but um that sounds absolutely perfect and on this note <laughs> i'm afraid i'm going to have to go because it's dinner time here yes. so um but it's been absolutely uh delightful yeah. talking to you guys and thank you so much for reading the book and i'm i'm so thrilled that you you like my sick and twisted stuff absolutely mm -hmm. it's Fantastic. always great to have you on so just let us know yeah, i know it took way too long to get you on this time but we'll we'll make it happen next time oh absolutely and i hope the next time in the states that we can have another Perhaps not as many quite. <laughs> <Those, laughs> the, the legendary cocktail contest, which was truly wonderful. Mm -hmm. But uh, maybe we can just have a few down by the bar so poor Neil doesn't have to do all the hard work. Yeah. <laughs> that is totally fine with me. We'll get some margaritas and have a good time. <laughs> Sounds like a yes. plan. Right. Oh, great. Well, listen, you guys, take care. Have a great weekend. Thank you. You as well. And uh, I actually don't cover that bunny with, with chocolate, Neil, okay? <laughs> I think it's gone I was, beyond I being was going to go decorate him after the interview. <laughs> yeah. Put some little <laughs> colored M&Ms in his eyes. Ooh. I don't know if there's eyes left. but Oh, oh, oh. Put them into uh, the sockets, into the inverted <laughs> sockets. Oh, okay. Even right. better. You shouldn't encourage me. But. No, no, no. <laughs> better than what you've got. At least you can make it funny uh -huh. and not just, well, I mean, it would be sick, but it would be funny sick. Uh-huh. <laughs> oh god All right, oh, get your dinner have a wonderful <laughs> weekend and we'll be in touch and talk with you soon yes oh brilliant we're lo looking forward to it take care you guys bye you too. have a great weekend okay bye. 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 bye 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 hi this is simon bamford holding on to his head with both hands you're listening to withoutyourhead.com excellent that sounds filthy as well. Good. <laughs> and kind of braggadocious. He's like with both hands. I mean... <laughs> hey, you, one has to big oneself up. 